Welcome to our study on the book of Romans. This is the Sonship Review Part 6, and this is session 29. Um, we've been going through these five probing questions. Uh, they're going to settle those major issues uh, that will confront our education and our establishment as sons. And if these five probing questions do their effectual work in us, then we're going to have absolute confidence in what our Heavenly Father says. We're going to trust His Word implicitly that it has everything that we need to be able to succeed as His sons and daughters. We're going to understand that sin does not disqualify us from continuing as His sons, but that that education is going to make us worthy of the vocation that we're going to be given. We're also going to understand that our failure to engage in the doctrine is not going to be fatal to our uh, sonship lives because we can recover from that. And then the fifth question is to assure us that no enemy that we have will have the ability to separate us from the love of God. Now we saw back in Romans 8.31 that God was for us. Remember that first question, if God be for us, who can be against us? And um, I didn't spend a lot of time breaking that down, but look, I want to show you in this chapter with these five questions, in verse 31, it, God is for us here in a number of ways, and we didn't talk about that back there, but I see this now, and I just want to talk about it this way, the power of God is for us, and, that, and that's true. In verse 32, uh, the grace of God is for us. This is, these are each of those questions, Remember, if God be for us, who can be against us? Then when you get to verses 33 to 34, you find that the justice of God is for us. And then lastly, in verses 35 to 39, we find that the love of God is for us. There's really, those are the four encapsulating ways in which God is for us. And so, because there are some things that are going to be against us, as a matter of fact, as we look at this fifth question, I'm going to tweak just ever so slightly something that I have said to you before. It's not going to be a big deal, but it is a little bit of a subtle difference, and I want to point it out. But we've been looking at these five questions. So now let's take a look at the verse. I know we've been doing verse 35, which is the fifth question. We've already done some work on that. So to kind of get us on moving on here, I just want to read this whole passage and point some things out. So here we are. Oh, I'm sorry. I had that on the PowerPoint. Uh, oh, it was in purple. I'm sorry. It, in my notes, when it's in purple, the P means it's on the PowerPoint. And when it's in blue, it means put it on the board. And when I looked at this a moment ago, I thought it was in blue. So I put it on the board, and now I see it's actually in purple. I'm sorry, you know, I just, I have a system, but unless you, you know, it's funny because Mark asked me before the session, he said, can you see clearly now? And I go, fairly? <laughs> who, who is that talking to me? Uh, and he said, can you tell colors? Because he was talking about the red lights. And I said, no, but I've memorized what's on top and what's on bottom. So, okay. So I guess this is worse than I thought. So here it is. Anyway, the grace of God, the justice of God, and the love of God. Just what I put on the board. All right. So here we go. Romans 8, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Now, I didn't put it on the PowerPoint this way when I first did this, but I want to read the rest of the passage because I'm, I'm going to call something to our attention here. So, it starts off with, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now I'll take it up in verse 36. 
as it is written, for thy sake. We are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, here's the thing that I want to point out here. We have already the first time through, we spent a little bit of time in these seven categories. I do have a couple of things to say about them that we have not talked about before. But I also want to spend some time on that list of ten things, or I'm going to call them creatures, that show up in verse 39. Because that's something we didn't take time looking at very much, and so we're going to do that. So here's what we have. We have three issues here that need to either be explained or identified. In that passage, we have seven categories. I know I don't have this on the PowerPoint. We have seven categories of, you could call it attack or suffering, whichever. And we need to say a few things about those so that we're looking at them correctly. So I, I know we talked about, you know, that's the attacks of Satan's policy of evil and they escalate. All that's true. I'm not changing any of that. But, uh, it, but we need to say something else about it. And then we need to uh, identify or explain the love of Christ and the love of God because that's what shows up at the end. And then thirdly, what we need to explain or identify are the ten creatures. And I want to tell you, I, when we get over there, I will show you why I'm calling them creatures. And we're going to, we're going to get to that today. So the first thing I'll do is I kind of wrote those in a wrong order. But we're going to do the love of Christ and the love of God issue first because there's a lot of ways to look at that phrase. And so, it's, and so here's the point that I'm going, to, I'm going to make to you when it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? When you first look at that, if you just read that normally, you would identify the love of Christ as the love that Christ has for you. Does Christ have love for us? Absolutely. All right. Then there's also a way of looking at it to say, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Or in other words, to look at it from the thing that Christ loves. That's something He loves. That is a second way to look at it. And there are some things that Christ loves. But I want to talk to you about this in a little bit of a different way. Because this is one of those times when Paul is using terminology, but he expects you from something he has already said to read more into a phrase than you would if you were just a normal person that picked up your Bible, read verse 35 and go, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Well, if you're saying the love that Christ has for you, I mean, who would ever be able to separate you from the love that Christ has for you? Why would you even ask that question? Because no one can control the love that he has for us. So that would, you know, that, that makes that question a little bit odd. And so, but, but he did say something earlier to us in the book of Romans about the love of God and the love of Christ that we should kind of have in our mind when we get here. So what I'm going to say to you is this. The love that's being spoken about here. Um, instead of me just writing it, let me just talk to you about it. When we say we love somebody, what are we saying? In general terms. We care about them, we care about them right? All right, okay. And if you do care about somebody, 
if you feel deeply about them, what else would be true? That's a really open-ended question. Okay, you wouldn't want any harm to come to them. And, um, okay, all right. Well, look, we're going to... I'm going to come back to this. I, I'm trying not to be too specific right now because I don't want to try to give you an answer about it, but we are going to see this. When you say that you love someone, well, I have to do something about it right now. Let's just say it this. Um, if, if, if someone says, uh, do you, you know, like if, if I said, you know, to... If you said to Billy, you know, do you think Mike loves you? She would say yes. And if you said, how do you know? Well, one of the ways that you would know if anybody loves you, Your what, actions. I'm sorry? Oh, that's really good. That's what I was after. I was really afraid that what you would say at first is, well, they would tell you that they love you. And that's not a bad thing, right? But you remember the old saying, talk is cheap? <laughs> you can say it. But if you don't show it, so love demonstrates itself, does it not? So here's the thing. You've already been told something in your Bible about the love of God. We're going we're gonna to read that verse in just a moment. But here's what you know about that love. This is not talking about God saying to you, although He does, this is not just him saying, hey, Ruby, I love you. That's not God just saying to Ruby or, or, or to Nancy that he loves you. Now, does God love each of us that way? Of course. He loves us corporately as a body, part of the body of Christ, but he also loves us individually. All that is true. But his love goes beyond, because if someone just says it to you, and that's all, then all you really have is this kind of warm, fuzzy feeling that comes with somebody saying to you that they love you. Yeah, then eventually it becomes empty. Okay, and if nothing else accompanies that, Karen's right, it becomes empty. So God's love does not, is not empty. It actually manifests itself in some very specific ways. I'm, I'm trying to set up our thinking for this so that when we see this, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Yes, the answer is going to be no one, but you already know in these questions, just knowing the answer is not enough. You've got to really know what it's asking and, and why it's asking that. And, so, and that's what I'm trying to get us to here. So let me read this next verse, and then we're going to talk about this a little further. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. Now, yeah, this is back there at the end of our justification issue. But look. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Now, I don't know if you remember everything that we talked about back there when we talked about what did that mean? The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. But I just want to remind you of what it is we need to be paying attention to here when we say, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Or later, down in verse 39, the love of God. Okay, so saying it that way, here, here's what we have to know. There is a specific way in which the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. And it is not just a sentimental expression of love. In other words, it's not just God saying to you, hey, you know I love you. Now that's not a bad thing for someone to say, but then because He does love us, He actually does some things that proves His love or that demonstrates His love. And those things are the things that are shed abroad in our hearts. Now, the reason I'm saying it that way is because the place where this gets done, the love of God gets shed abroad 
in our hearts, not in the realm of our feelings, not in the realm of our emotions. There are many people who, look, I, you ever watch that show Cops on TV? First of all, I get the idea that if I was, a, if I was an officer, after about three years on the job, I'd just be done. Because everybody that's doing something wrong, none of them can tell you the truth about anything. That is just unbelievable. You know, I mean, it's the most ridiculous. I'm not trying to get off on this, but, uh, you know, to step too far aside into this. But I just, anyway, so with, 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 I, I'm going to make an illustration about this here, and I, I hope I'm not going to lose my thought, but I see these people. Here's a guy. He is so stoned out of his head, he can't walk. He can't, okay, that sounds familiar. Uh, he, can't, he can't function. He can't do any of that. His, he, his speech is nonsense. And the guy says, the officer says, what are you doing? And he goes, I'm looking for Jesus. I promise you, that's what he says. I'm looking for Jesus. And then they want to talk about how much they love God. All right, let me tell you what that is. I guess that's a chemically induced love of God. But you know what? The love that most people have for God is just this emotional type attachment to what they think, you know, God is. Because they've kind of made God in the image they need Him to be in, that He's going to do the things for them they want Him to do. And so they kind of have this love for Him. As a son or a daughter, you realize, in fact, Jesus talked to the believing remnant of Israel about this. Remember what He said, if you love me, does anybody know the rest of that? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You know why? Because talk is cheap. Oh, I just love God. But do you really do what He wants you to do? Well, I mean, see? And so my point here is to say that the kind of love that is being talked about here is the kind that isn't just said, but it gets demonstrated. So it's not shed abroad in our emotions. It is shed abroad in our heart. Now, look at this next verse. Now we're going to go to Romans 6 and look at verse 17. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which is delivered to you. Now notice that, well, first of all, I'll ask you a question. Can the heart obey? Well, it can, because he said they obeyed from the heart. All right, now, I do want to talk about that, but here's what I want to ask you. Look at that verse and tell me, what did they obey? from their heart. What was it they obeyed? The form of doctrine. In other words, God gave them something in their, that, you know what, this was meant to be in their heart. And that thing is the evidence of His love. So when you see the love of God, this is not, I have people say this all the time, not totally true. It's just a travesty that the, it, their understanding of it is so shallow. But, you know, they see people and they go, God loves you. But you know what most of them think that means? He, he's perfectly content with whatever's going on with you. And he's not. Now, does he love them? Yes. But, all right. Sometimes I feel like my speech today is as disjointed as my sight. But you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. When he gave them that form of doctrine, it was meant to accomplish something in them. And they had the ability to say yes and obey it, or say no and disobey it, right? And so here, that thing has taken place in their heart. 
I'm reminded, look, you don't have this in your notes, so I'm just going to read it to you. In James chapter 2, James is writing to the believing remnant. And you know what he's talking about here? He's talking about actions and not just words. So listen to this. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, so they don't have any clothing and don't have anything to eat, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? What's the answer to that question? Nothing. Because good intentions, I'm gonna, like the word Karen used a while ago, those are empty. You've got to do something with it. So when we see the love of God or the love of Christ, don't just think about a sentimental, emotional feeling that God has for you. Think about what He did, what how he demonstrated that love to you. And that, that happens in our life all along. I'm going to take you to a verse. Kind of, oh, well, I'm going to take it to you now. No, you don't have it in your notes, sorry. Romans 5.8. I, I, I added this late after I had done this. But just listen to this. But God commendeth his love toward us. He commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What's the evidence of God's love for a sinner? He, he sent His Son to die. There's the proof of His love. So, once you're saved, is that the end of the proof of God's love? No. No. Now there are other things, and guess what? Those things are going to be done in our heart. So it's the heart that says yes or no to the doctrine. So that's what I'm trying to get us to. That the love of Christ and the love of God is not just God's sentimental feeling about us, but it is the fact now that we're not just supposed to be looking at the feeling of it, but because this stuff is shed abroad in our heart and we obey from the heart that form of doctrine. In other words, this is the provision. So now I'm going to put this word out here. And if you've written this down, write this beside it. Because the love of God is, I promise you this is right, is the provision that God has made for us in our I'm not going to just name one area because he's going to do this in every area. The, because the love is not talking about the feeling, it's talking about the demonstration of it. Because when you love someone, it shows up in your actions. And this is God's actions to be able to keep us from being overcome by the things that will stop our sonship life. And because He loves us, we get those things. So, ask you a moment ago, does the heart have the capacity to obey? Well, it, it does, because that's what they obeyed from the heart. And so, now, I want to take you to Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. Now, I know we're ahead of where we are, but here we go. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe and thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So the question now is, can the heart believe? Well, of course it can. Look at this next verse. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. The only point I'm trying to make in all of this is, that love of God that first got shed abroad in our hearts, whereby we knew that God loved us because there was something He did for us even while we were yet sinners. He sent His Son. And now that we're His sons and daughters, He's not through making a provision for us. So when we, when we talk about something separating us from the love of Christ or separating us from the love of God, it is not talking about making it so Christ and God don't love us anymore. It is talking about separating us 
from the provision that they gave to us which we needed in order to succeed as sons and daughters. I know that sounds like I went way around the moon to get to that, but that's what I'm talking about when I'm saying we now have a resource that keeps us from, when these five questions, who will separate us? I, I, I'm sorry, if God be for us, who shall be against us? All of these five questions, these are things that are against us. We now have a resource to show God not only is for us in word, He is for us in deed. Well, how is He for us in deed if He's not intervening in my physical circumstances? Because without intervening in our physical circumstances, He is giving us the doctrine that supplies our inner man with everything. That's how you live out of grace. Yeah, were you going to say something? Okay. I was looking at both of you. And so I was just trying to figure it out. Okay. 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 Well, that's good. Okay. All right. So now, uh, the, point, the point I'm trying to... Oh, where am I here? Oh, good. 30 seconds. All right, look. So instead of moving us to this next part, which is... The separation issue, that's really important. Is there any question about this? And I, With the provision, he guarantees our success as long as we follow. That's exactly right. That's right. That provision is so that the answer can be, who shall separate? No one. That's the guarantee. That's exactly right. So, when you see the love of Christ, the love of God, that's really what I'm looking at there. Not so much that he's going to quit loving us and it's not so much although he will that there's something he loves although there is it's that he's now talking to us about God's love not as a sentimental emotional feeling but as an actual provision that we're supposed to latch on to and that provision is the proof it should be as much proof for us that God loves us, as to the sinner, the fact that he sent his son is the proof that he loves them while they were yet sinners. Does that make sense? I promise you, this is what this is getting at right here. Now, when we come back from the break, I want to, you, you say, well, if that's it, then what does it mean who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Because there's two ways. One of those cannot be separated and the other one can. And I want to show you those so we can sort those out. Okay.